Great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to Fred for coming back. He, uh, we did a session like this last year in a bit different format. So uh, what I've asked him to do is uh, allow me and, uh, and then Rebecca to ask him the first two questions, and then we'll wait uh, for you guys uh, to join in. Uh, he's told us that all, all subjects and topic areas are, are fine. He realized he's being recorded, uh, and uh, so uh, we will take it from there. I'm also a politician at heart, so <laughs> and a lawyer, so I'll handle those two appropriately. Yeah. And and again, uh, to, to reinforce Holly's point, uh, these these are designed to be student discussions, conversations, and, and the reason this was originally started as a program here was because students wanted opportunities to talk with with people who had. With, uh, quote unquote real world <laughs> experiences and, and talk about what they learned about leadership. Uh, so, so any and all questions uh, about that and about your future and about careers. I know uh, some of you are probably thinking about law school, so that might be an area you want to get into as well. But let me start with the first uh, question, if I may. Uh, oh, easy. These have not been rehearsed. <laughs> I asked him. I asked him to let me see a copy of the questions uh, that he planned to ask. And he refused to do so. So uh, if you get some no comments, it's because uh, uh, I stopped him midway uh, before you guys get started. Uh, it's great having a chance to come over and first see some of you again. I met many of you during the uh, reception when you guys first got here uh, back in August with kind of deer in the headlight looks, not knowing what you'd gotten yourself into. Uh, I hope that over the course of the last month that things have settled down at least a little bit. Uh, I came back to the foundation, uh, I've been on actually on the foundation board of directors since probably 96 or thereabouts. And uh, when my predecessor uh, decided to retire and go do something else, uh, the president uh, cajoled me into coming to College Station. Uh, you guys will understand this, but I think you will, Joe, and Chuck and some others will. It's like, don't throw me in that briar patch. Uh, it's kind of one of those things like, you mean you want me to come to College Station and live at uh, in College Station at Texas A&M again? There can't be nothing better than that. Uh, I had lived in Washington three different, on three separate occasions, and I managed to escape the third time, and I have no intentions whatsoever of ever living there again. Uh, three times was enough, and for somebody who was not in the military or in the Secret Service or... Uh, in the Foreign Service or uh, something like that. And, and going back to leaving Washington is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> being, that, being there is also a good thing and a, a wonderful experience. So, but coming here was, was sort of like a full circle deal because I've been on the board of the foundation since the mid-90s. And uh, coming here to take over this responsibility uh, was, was a really pretty cool deal. And so I'm happy to be back in College Station. The other thing I can brag on is the fact that, you see, for 35 or 36 years, <clears throat> I had to, like, travel to get to an A&M football game. I either had to go to, I had to leave from Austin or Waco or Dallas or get here from Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. So I don't go to out-of-time games anymore. It's a wonderful feeling getting up and being there. So <laughs> that part makes it special. And then more importantly, uh, besides the fact that I like my job, and I'll talk about that, I presume, if the questions are worth a hoot, uh, uh, I, am, I am glad that, uh, that you guys are here. And I personally get, get uh, motivated by having the opportunity uh, to see and meet folks like you uh, at your points in your careers. And, what contributions you ultimately will make to this old world that I hopefully will leave behind in a little bit better shape than it was when I got here. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. So let me, let me start off. Uh, Robert Gates uh, has written up and, and made speeches about uh, the opportunity Texas A&M provided for him as the president of the university in terms of learning. And I use that as an example for our students to think about the fact that it never stops. Lifelong learning continues on. And uh, he's going to write another book, uh, now that the first one's been, been published to a pretty wide acclaim, uh, about uh, senior management. He feels like change management was very important in what he, he had to do at the Department of Defense. And he said he learned a lot of those lessons while he was here as president of A&M. 
What do you think, uh, what are your observations uh, two years now? What have you been learning about the university, about education, as well as about yourself? I guess I've been involved in change management. I'm now the second longest tenured person on the foundation staff. <laughs> My tech guy's been there one week longer. No, I didn't get rid of them. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did not get rid of these folks. Uh, uh, we were in the process of going through some transition with retirements and other stuff, and so, which is a little bit different uh, from a management ex standpoint. You know, probably one of my toughest, it had to be, the toughest, toughest management roles that I've ever, ever been involved in. I used to manage a law firm. Uh, and fortunately, I only had to manage one office of a law firm. Uh, but I had 110 or so attorneys, all type A personalities, uh, all, you know, thinking they could run the office better than I did. And then dealing with the challenges that they had with 80 or 90 or so other uh staff people uh, who worked and supported that law firm practice. Uh, and then at the time, at least when I first started, I was one of 13 offices. And when I left, we were like at 75 offices. And so it's a, it's a, so balancing those kinds of things in the learning process. But you, you know, I've, I've found a, a, a lot of the things that I was able to uh, get through, I don't want to sound braggadocious when say, that I was able to accomplish, but things that I was able to get through came as a result of my developing one-on-one -on -one personal relationships with the folks that I had to, to manage. Uh, I, one of my predecessors, a couple of people before me, uh, who's a little bit older than I am, so his, he's sort of a little bit more old school. His response, he, he told me, he says, Fred, just, you know, when you get one of these emails and where one of these guys or gals is asking for a yes or no answer, and you know that the answer is more complicated than that, don't answer the email. <laughs> because it's, it's, it, you know, before you know it, it'll be all over the law firm and you have like changed some policy without going through the right channels. Uh, go have a conversation with them. And so what I ended up doing was I had to walk around management style in my office. We had four floors. And I actually tried to get on every floor every day. Now, you know, many times I ended up with more tasks on my plate or issues that I was trying to solve as a result of the folks that I ran into. But it was a bet, much better way, in my view, of communicating with the folks that I had the responsibility of leading. And uh, I think that helped tremendously. Uh, Dr. Gates, when he first arrived here at A&M, uh, it, sort of the, the management style that he used at the Defense Department was not unlike the management style that Dr. Gates employed when he came to College Station originally. Uh, he evaluated the folks around him. Uh, he got rid of some folks who were fairly popular, uh, made some, some changes uh, in the upper levels of the university's leadership in both its structure as well as its personnel, and gathered around him a team of individuals, <coughs> pardon me, that uh, uh, he employed or deployed as the case may be uh, to, to, to accomplish the task that he has here. Needless to say, the bureaucracy here in an academic environment, uh, which is also within a political environment, is different from the Washington, D.C. Pentagon involvement, I mean, uh, environment, uh, but nonetheless big organizations. And being able to, first of all, gra grasp an understanding of what makes the organization tick, grasp an understanding of where you can, you know, punch it and what's going to happen when you, you know, kind of like a balloon and you punch it and what kind of response are you going to get uh, so that you can understand the circumstances in which you're making a decision. I think more importantly, though, it's to get people that you're leading to get to the point where those people help you formulate the direction in which you're trying to go. Now, you may have kind of given them a hint in terms of the direction you want them to go, but ultimately, in order to have a team, I think, to work effectively, you've got to have a bunch of folks who buy into what it is that you've chosen to do. It's not a command and control structure, like Rebecca would tell you about here, where it's like, you will do this because the guy up there said do this. <laughs> no, it works sort of a different sort of way in an environment that is, that is different from, for example, in the military. And it's a situation where if you can get people to buy in, to, first of all, help you get to the point where you want to get, buy into that, then they're much more willing, much more willing to uh, help implement and be uh, defenders of, of the direction of the policy that you've chosen to go. Very good. Rebecca? And I wonder, is his book going to be as well acclaimed as it was? <laughs> I may have him back here. So, over the years, our views on leadership 
tend to evolve and our skills strengthen and change. What's something you wish you would have known starting out back when you were just starting your career about leadership that you've learned maybe the hard way along the way? Hmm. Why didn't you tell me you want to ask me that question? <laughs> uh, it, it, it is, it is uh, one of the things when, you, when you've got a backing up. First of all, if you're leading, trying to lead a volunteer organization where you've got people who just kind of show up and help, uh, and I'm thinking back to, frankly, in my days of student government here, believe it or not, uh, we had a program uh, which was a refrigerator rental program that student government ran. And you know the little, little they're, much more, they're much more sophisticated than they <laughs> were then, but they were little brown refrigerators, and they all looked alike. And uh, we rented them for usage in the dorm. And the problem with that was getting enough volunteers to stay around after school was finally over to make sure to get the refrigerators back to a place where we could get them cleaned and get them ready to go for the next semester when students were coming back. Getting people to involve themselves in a volunteer organization and, and trying to develop what the hook is going to be uh, to get them to be willing to do something sort of out of the ordinary uh, to be participants was very much a challenge. And so trying to develop a skill set like that in a volunteer organization, I think, is, is, is a, something I would like to have more experience with. Um, but you kind of get the same thing even in a non-volunteer environment, uh, particularly when you got strong personalities involved. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to get folks who want to be led to go with you. The difficult challenge is where you've got people who don't necessarily want to be led and you are trying to develop a set of options which allows them to get on the same page where you want to be. Well, uh, uh, the group is, is thinking through some questions. Oh, I see tons of them out there. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, uh, last time you were here, you told a really uh, interesting story about your own experience uh, and, and I think it, it uh, relates to issues we're seeing in America today and that was you talked about integrating uh, a high school uh, in uh, East Texas. Do you mind uh, sharing some of those uh, insights and then reflecting a bit on, on have, have we come farther or are we still facing similar kinds of problems? I grew up in a small town in East Texas called San Augustine. San Augustine is the <laughs> oldest American town in Texas. Uh, which means those Spanish settlements don't count. Um, and we, we were established in like 1717 or something like that. And my family moved to St. Augustine uh, when, uh, I guess I was one year, one year old, uh, so in 1955, and my father moved there to be uh, high school principal of what was the segregated all-black high school. Uh, so we had like three buildings in in, in St. Augustine that had, which we still have today, but three buildings in St. Augustine where education took place. One was this one campus, which all the black kids in town went to from ages first grade to, to high to senior year. And then we had a first through sixth grade elementary campus, which the white kids went to. And then we had a seventh through 12th grade uh, classroom, which the white kids went to, and there were no Hispanics uh, back in 19, in those days. Uh, at least not in St. Augustine. So that was a population that made up a city of about you know, 3,000 folks and roughly probably about 45 percent of the of the population was black and the rest, rest of the population was white. My father was principal as I said of the entire 12 grades and in 1965 after the Civil Rights Act was was enacted uh, in 64 uh, the school system moved to freedom of choice uh, and we had some teachers who, my mother being one of them, who went over to uh, what had been the all-white schools and uh, got on the faculty and vice versa. We had white teachers who came over to my dad's campus. And we also had some students who exercised. But let me tell you, there were like very, very few students, like maybe like three black kids went to the white school. Uh, and that was about what it amounted to. Uh, 1970, 
after a number of the schools had been uh, had uh, followed on either because of court cases or because of uh, of making decisions, uh, our schools opened segregated in the fall of 1970, my junior year. But we were also in the middle of uh, a court case in the federal district court in Fort, in Beaumont, Texas. And basically, the judge was making a decision as to whether or not he was going to force our schools to desegregate. Uh, I, being the smart aleck that I was, uh, back in August had made a decision not to go back to my dad's school for my junior year, but to go be one of the black kids who went to the white school uh, and uh, start my junior year there, uh, which my father agreed with, said it was fine. Uh, probably one of the most stupid decisions I made because I'd had to do, I had done two days for football because I played on the high school football team. So anyway, two days before football season starts, classes start uh, for a week. At the end of that week on Friday, the federal judge ruled that the schools had to indeed desegregate. So we shut down the schools, had another week of four, of two a days, which absolutely <laughs> was horrible. Uh, and then we reopened the, the schools uh, the next week, totally integrated. So we had like, my dad had the fifth through eighth grade on our campus uh, in the, where I had been going to school and the first through fourth grade was at what had been the all white elementary school and the high school became the high school. So that was sort of like, all of a sudden it was like desegregation uh, as a result of, but that was 1971. And that's not that long ago in the whole scheme of things. Uh, we, were, we were one of the last schools in the state of Texas uh, to do that. Now, did we have any problems? Uh, no, kids, kids, well, I mean, most of us knew each other anyway, and so the, 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 our parents probably, not my parents, but parents probably had more of a problem with what happened in terms of, of uh, integration uh, or desegregation uh, than the students did. Uh, indeed, the school board presidents and my family doctors, son and I, led a walkout one day. Uh, so you got the principal of the middle school or the intermediate school and the school board president, who's a white guy, uh, uh, leading a, uh, it was like one of these deals, like don't come back in after morning break kind of a deal. And we just all stayed out in the parking lot and everybody kind of followed along and they thought we were about to have some big racial incident and cop cars started pulling up and finally they approached Craig and me and said like, I mean, what's the deal? Why are y'all leading this? This guy, we don't like the damn dress code. <laughs> and, and it was it was an issue of Craig wanted to grow his hair longer down his collar and uh, uh, we just kind of okay I like that idea I couldn't get mine over my collar uh, but I could, I could I could get it a tad bit longer so we uh, uh, we uh, that was that was about the biggest extent of what we had now over the years I will also say that that you know you we, we didn't do as many things together as I think we should have as a community because you'd have like, like senior prom, for example. Well, that was sort of like a white prom, and it was sort of like a black prom, and then some of us kind of, because of our relationships, went back and forth between the two. Uh, as the years passed, though, those things kind of passed away, and so uh, uh, it just took a little while. So we've got some, we, we, we did not have significant challenges, and maybe a part of that has to do with the fact that sort of the way my folks raised me and had a little bit to do with the fact that I didn't go out looking for problems. I looked for opportunities to try to do things together and, and solve problems. My senior year in high school, I was elected state president of Future Farmers of America, the blue and gold that Holly talked about. Uh, you know, that was a, that's kind of a kind of a big deal uh, when I was was named FFA president. And then the next year, I was national FFA secretary. So I'm the first black guy that did either of those two things in organizations that just don't normally hang out in the black community. Same thing here at Texas a and I think, though, if you get yourself into a position, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, whatever color or, or ethnic group from which you hail, uh, the important thing is to express yourself, do things that make you stick out as an individual because of what you're contributing, not because of the way you look. And if you can get beyond those things, uh, uh, then I think you're on the path to to having a great deal of success. We've, we continue to have problems in this country today though. And, and uh, sometimes I think, 
Sometimes I think, I, what I worry about is that, let me put it this way, what I worry about is that the, swin, the pendulum uh, keeps swinging back and forth uh, and doesn't seem to seek any type of equilibrium. For example, there was this whole move, movement in the 60s and in the early 70s to try to get people to, to do things together, people of different backgrounds, cultures. And then all of a sudden, and I, and I don't use this term negatively, but I use this term to be, expression, to be an expression of what I'm trying to say, diversity became a cool thing. And once you started talking about diversity, then the question was is, well, how do I now begin to preserve those things that make me diverse and that make me different and that make me unique because I'm missing out on these cultural experiences that I don't have anymore because you guys have forced us to all live together and do all these things together, so therefore, let's be separatists again. So that, and I don't mean separatists in a negative sense, but, but, but let's, let's, let's promote ourselves in terms of our ways to get together. That's an equilibrium sw swing uh, that I, I'm not saying it's detrimental by any means, uh, but I don't think that it is always necessarily helpful uh, in terms of trying to to bridge gaps and to, and to overcome problems that we have to deal with and have to live with as human beings on this earth. Good. Just a thought. Who's got the first question then? Yes, sir. We hear often in, um, in these leadership series about the importance of mentors. I was wondering what value or role mentors played in your leadership development and how you would advise us to seek out and find the best mentors. I don't think there's any such thing as a best mentor. And I also don't believe that there's like some rule that you gotta have one. Uh, I have had mentors, I said I'm mentors now, but I have had mentors throughout my life in different stages. Uh, I guess probably my best mentor uh, was my pop. Uh, but you know, dad's been gone since 1980. I guess he still sort of mentors me because I still, do things that I think he probably would have done or think about things in the way that I believe he would have thought about them. Uh, and so that's kind of an ever-present mentor. Uh, beyond that, in different stages of life, there have been folks that, that I have looked up to and that I've tried to spend time with and to grow with and to benefit from their experiences, uh, depending on kind of what I'm doing. I mean, you know, when I was when I was when I was in Future Farmers, there was there was this guy who ran the Future Farmers organization, or ran the officer team, and and uh, Billy was my mentor during that time frame. And even when I was a national officer the next year, I could always pick up the phone and call him or go spend time with him and and uh, uh, get the kind of guidance that I thought I needed. Uh, and you and 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 as I moved through my first not my White House intern gig, but my, well, for President Ford, but my first real job in Washington uh, was as a legislative assistant to, to, uh, President, um, to Senator John Tower from Texas. And John Tower became not only my mentor, but my teacher, my friend, uh, and you know, one of the greatest disappointments in my life professionally uh, was to, and he gave me my chance in politics. Uh, if it had not been for John Tower, I would, you know, if you count, John Tower was the guy who introduced me to the guy who became the 43rd president of the United States. <laughs> John Tower was the guy who introduced me to the guy who became the 41st president of the United States and for whom I work again now. Uh, and one of my biggest disappointments was after President Bush nominated Senator Tower to be Secretary of Defense, we were unable to get his nomination confirmed and my job was to get nominations confirmed. It hurt like hell uh, to not only have the failure on behalf of, I mean, for this guy who was my mentor and gave me my chance to do the things that I've had the chance to do, uh, but also it was the first defeat we had uh, in my role working for President Bush. Uh, so all throughout life, there are different folks. I guess probably now mentors probably Mentors can also be very, very good, dear personal friends, depending upon what kinds of experiences they have had. Uh, so now I sort of have, 
I guess it's probably an aging thing more than anything else. Uh, but I have a lot more sort of mentor friend mentors who are also uh, close personal friends. Uh, uh, I think in in one sense there are it's kind of there are it's kind of like in some some uh, churches some religious groups and you'll have like uh, small groups kind of deal where you sort of like have somebody who's sort of got your back but by the same token who helps grade your paper. Uh, uh, those those opportunities is where it sort of gravitates. But now that's not to say that at your points in your lives now, and I know this room has got a wide range, uh, but that friends could not be mentors as well. It just depends upon what sort of experiences they've had and, and how much you can share and grow. Because a mentor doesn't tell you what to do, in my view, and if I'm violating some mentor policy you can tell me. <laughs> a mentor a mentor doesn't tell you what to do a mentor helps you reach the conclusion that allows you to do the best thing for you and I'm not talking about in a, in a negative selfish best way for you sense but it's like you know this is sort of direction I want to go let's talk about how we get there or how is this this step going to affect uh, affect a decision I might make five years from now, and those kinds of things are, are sort of the, the 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 roles that I think mentors play. Yes, they're important, and having a single one I do not think is necessary. I think having more than one is fine. And frankly, I I'm maybe they don't like it, maybe I'm kind of forcing myself on them, but I have tried to also do that for uh, some of the folks that I've come in contact here in Bush School, and also. Uh, in undergraduates uh, schools and kids and that I've just come to know and if they feel comfortable sharing with me and me trying to help them I got the time I'll do it now don't y'all all show up tomorrow I don't <laughs> and maybe much but actually I've got I've got like five coming at three o'clock this afternoon to talk about leadership uh, but uh, they've got a class project and one of them I'm kind of semi mentoring and so he said, can I bring my class project to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So anyway. Yes, sir. You've led in several different environments from private sector to public sector to here at A&M. How have you had to change your leadership style to fit those, those different environments? Here is easy. Well, no, here's, no. Yeah, here is easy uh, because I really kind of don't have to change my leadership. I'm in, a, I'm in a really weird position coming back to A&M. What Holly did not mention to you is that I also used to be Vice Chairman of the Board of Regents of the A&M system. And so I've kind of been a regent, and so I kind of know some of the stuff that's going on that people don't want to talk about. Right, Dr. Herman? Uh, and so, uh, so I kind of have that part of the equation in it. And then sort of like there's a regent network of all of us who used to serve and those who do serve. And then you kind of know what's happening in the administration. And, and I'm just this odd duck that George Bush asked to come run this little foundation that's hanging out over here. And he shows up every now and then. So people don't know what to make of me is what it basically amounts to. <laughs> and actually, actually, I like that a whole lot. Uh, that's, that's one of those leadership styles where it's kind of like, well, you just guess what I'm thinking or going to do. And then, you know, ultimately, and, and you know, God, I hope he lives forever. Uh, I know he won't, and I don't look forward to the day that President Bush is no longer with us. But as long as he is alive, I can use his name just as. <laughs> you don't want President Bush calling you, do you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at using his name. You know, I, I, hey, look, I was his voice in Congress of the United States. I can damn sure be his voice here in College Station. <laughs> uh, so that part, that part. Uh, that part uh, in terms of changing the style. Uh, I also had a, had a point where, and I wasn't at sort of the top of the pyramid, but I was, at one time in the private sector, I ran a, I was a government affairs vice president for an, a major airline company. And my job was basically to get Congress and to get the, the executive branch to do what it was we wanted to do to let us fly wherever we wanted to. And, you know, do the stuff that you do in the airline business. I was our lobbyist. And so there it was kind of a, a different kind of leadership deal because you had to like not only 
make sure your people in the business structure understood why some of the stuff they wanted to do or thought they should be able to do or could, that Congress, there was no way in hell Congress or the Federal Aviation Administration was going to let them do it. So then you sort of had that flip piece, and so you had to make sure you could communicate effectively to them that we can't do it that way, we got to find another way to do it because I can't make that happen. And then sort of the flips, the upper side was then convincing a majority of Congress uh, that uh, that my idea was a better idea. Uh, so that's when you kind of got it going in both directions because the congressmen, they don't, they've got to, they, most of the time elected leaders have to figure out it's in their best interest. And once you can explain to them that it's in their best interest to do what it is you want to do, so you kind of got to bridge that gap, then you can finally get accomplished what it is uh, you want to accomplish. And that's basically what, what, what people in the public policy lobbying part of the business do. It's what I did for the president, which is how do I get these yahoos to have enough of them to vote in the way that we want them to do so that we could accomplish the public policy objectives that the president had set out and chosen to do. Were there different leadership styles in each one of those you'd emphasize? Communication skills? Communi well, I think, I think communication skills are, it, it, that one permeates the whole nine yards uh, of the, across the board, I mean, not just nine yards, across the board. Uh, you've got to be able to take sometimes very, very difficult issues and distill them down to, to which reminds me of something about today's politics I'll mention, uh, distill them down to, to uh, enough uh, nuggets that you could communicate them in a quick fashion so that somebody will understand and then believe that you're persuasive enough that that's the right thing to do. One of the things I think that is most disappointing about today's public policy arena uh, is the fact that we have, the country has moved to a point where we have uh, become so self-conscious about labels and trying to characterize someone quickly and put them into a category uh, from which they can never escape. Uh, and and uh, uh, causing what I think is a great deal of discord uh, amongst our elected officials trying to get anything accomplished. I mean, until we get to the point where people have, where leaders reach the conclusion that they don't have to have 100% of what they want all the time and that their way is the only way, and if you don't uh, agree with the position that I have reached, then something's wrong with your character. Uh, that's, that's a sad state of affairs, I think, from a political standpoint in our country. You know, because, I mean, there were, there were times where we'd have knockdown, drag out fights on a budget provision with a Democrat from New York, and the next day he'd be our lead guy in terms of going into uh, getting the coalition together to go in and do, uh, go to Kuwait and fight back Saddam Hussein. I mean, you can't, you, you can't spend time disparaging people's character and expect them to ever get to a point where they would trust you to not only be on your side with an issue where they would not normally be, perhaps jeopardizing their political careers and their chances to get reelected. You kind of got that piece, but also getting to the point where you can actually have a conversation about it. And if folks don't get in the room with each other, uh, if folks don't start out with a premise that we're trying to solve a problem uh, and find some mutual ground, and both of us, you know, don't one of us have, doesn't have to to emerge with a pelt you know, a new skin on our belt and the other one, you know, naked when they're walking out. We got, we got, we, we got to do better than that because otherwise we're never going to get anything uh, accomplished. And that works, that, that is a congressional issue in a public policy sense and an executive legislative branch. That is an issue in a community. That can be an issue in a church or a synagogue. That can be an issue in a family. So if, if you can't figure out how to get beyond the ad hominems 
and get to the point where you're having a discussion about the things that really separate you and where you might be able to find some ground, you ain't gonna get a damn thing accomplished. Now, part of being a leader, I think, part of the responsibilities of a leader in that sense is to be able, if, if you're gonna take on that role, I'm gonna be the leader, then you need to take on the role as well and the responsibility of getting people together to get to the point where you want them to go. It's kind of like what I was saying other, earlier about Dr. Gates when he came here at a and You get people to buy into what it is you want to do, help them help you reach that conclusion, and then lead them down the path you know, to salvation or whatever. Um, I don't think enough, enough of our folks get in a room together. And let me tell you, we had no choice but to get in a room because when the president was elected president, both houses of Congress were decidedly Democratic. And we didn't have many Republicans at all. So we, if we intended to do anything in the political power structure, we had to, like, do deals. We had to, like, come to some common ground. And whether it was Clean Air or Budget Act or on and on and on, the things that I could enumerate from, <laughs> from, uh, from his presidency, uh, it required us to work together. That environment does not exist in Washington today. You you have a real passion for public service and for leadership, and it seems as though you've been involved your whole life in public service in some form or fashion. What, but it's not always easy. And what are some bumps along the way? Have you ever had doubt maybe along the way? And then how did you overcome those doubts, those bumps? In the I have doubts every morning when I get there. <laughs> Live, I have doubts living every day. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a constant learning. I look at it as sort of a constant learning experience. Uh, there are always going to be bumps. There are going to be, be uh, how do I describe this? It, it's kind of like, I used to describe this, use this to kind of de describe life. And it's kind of one of these things like you've got a big old freeway, big old highway. You've got about six lanes. And you're moving from lane to lane. And you see this exit road that looks interesting. Mm -hmm. And so you decide... Eh, I'll take this road. Just so you know you gotta come back at some point in time. So having 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 the opportunity to be be sort of flexible uh helps you deal with those imponderables uh uh which some people might look at them as doubts. I look at them as additional challenges in trying to to uh move the ship forward, to keep the ship in the or the road the car between the ditches, however you want to refer to it. Um there are a lot of skill sets that you can practice. You can practice public speaking. You can practice writing. You can, and you can learn from others in terms of, of, of uh, how to do better at those things. Uh, you can even get help learning how to intellectually deal with problems, uh, logical kinds of problems. Uh, but, but ultimately, you have, to, you have this toolkit, and you need to Ultimately, this is the, this this guy and this guy, the heart and the head are the two things that have got to come together at some point to be able to to uh, assist you in dealing with the, if you want to call them doubts, but I just look at them as different challenges. It's like, well, uh, that old balloon came out on the other side when I punched it, so maybe I gotta gotta think about how I can get it back in its space. Yes, sir. Have you ever had a problem with you trying to be a leader at something and somebody else trying to be a leader on the same thing at the same time and there can only be room for one leader? Yeah, form a <laughs> partnership. <laughs> uh, and I say that a little bit facetiously. Uh, you know, I don't have to be the lead dog all the time. In fact, there are a lot of times when you really don't want to be the lead dog and you end up becoming the lead dog because nobody steps into the vacuum that's created and somebody's got to do something. So in a circumstance like that, it'd probably be one of those situations, particularly if we're going in the same direction, I don't care. Let, this, let the other guy or gal, as the case may be, be the, uh, be the, be the, the leader. Uh, now, if we're wanting to go in different directions, then that creates a different scenario. Because if you got, and let's just take, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. You got, you've got the President of the United States wanting to go one way, and you got the Speaker of the House wanting to go the other way, and they haven't figured out a way to get their act together yet. Okay, that's two people trying to occupy the same space, even though the Speaker is not as powerful as the President of the United States is. The President of the United States doesn't have votes. The Speaker of the House has votes, and legislature's got to exist with the executive branch. 
So then the question becomes, do you guys want to do anything to move the country forward or in a direction? And if so, is there common ground that the two of you can find and sit down and actually talk about and then actually get there? Uh, that's a different sort of a scenario, but I think they need to talk. But that's my own political view, which, by the way, I'm nonpartisan now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for coming here today. Thanks for your service. Uh, Bush 40, uh, President George Bush 43 and President Barack Obama both considered themselves consensus builders. I'm sure they, they wouldn't say that their effort to do that has been that successful. But don't you, wouldn't you say that the failure to do that kind of fuels the belief that you need to draw a hard line or you don't get anything you want? So isn't the, that was a big question. That's a big question. I know where you're going. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a big question. Okay. Um, all right. First thing, I think that the hard lines that are being drawn these days and that people represent, and they're representing the views of their constituents, um, are more as a result of technology more than anything else in the face of this earth. Because if we didn't have these guys, uh, and, and you know these guys are like this. I'm thinking about the new six plus, uh, <laughs> but you know my big old brick phone was this big. It was it was this was the size of the phone I had when I left. When I left, I'm serious. When I left the White House in 1992, these were the phones, the size of the phones we used. Then we got them real skinny, and now we're back carrying around the world with us. Uh, what has happened is that. I, I, I am, I am mystified is not the word. I'm disappointed that individuals have gotten to the point where they don't want to even hear the other side of what the people across the table are saying from them. For example, we, re we reinforce our own views by listening to people, whether it's television or radio or websites or whatever, who agree with us 100%. And therefore, I got to be right. I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I'm, 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 Rachel is my woman or Rush is my guy. And if, you know, they are going to reinforce exactly what I think. And once I get to that point, then everybody else must be wrong. I used to do Fox TV a lot. And particularly when I lived in Washington. And, you know, it was amazing that, and they kind of started this. Well, it actually goes back to, to some folks that Joe and I can remember uh, who used to do some uh, uh, television back and forth, but now it's become, you, you got to be able to get on television and in your short time frame with this guy that you're sitting next to, make sure and just destroy him with whatever sword and weapon you can use and talk over him the entire time that the two of you are supposedly having an intelligent conversation with people of different views about a subject that is important enough to be on the news. No, I got to yell and scream and say bad things about Joe that probably aren't true and he'll do the same thing to me and it's, it's, it, it is a sad state that we have reached but a lot of that I mean folks want to hear it folks want to see it maybe that's why we have reality TV so much y'all may love reality TV I, I, I that, that bothers me yes and that has been exacerbated those circumstances I think have exacerbated sort of where we have come from a leadership standpoint in terms of the country 9-11 was one of the worst days of my life. And, and, and I, you know, it was just a horrible day. Up until 9-11, though, the 43rd president of the United States was having a very, very difficult time getting any sea legs on anything in the Congress of the United States. And it was exacerbated by the fact that the election ended up having to be decided as a result of a Supreme Court decision. So the guys, George W's administration was, they had no sea legs at all. And everything was, just, it was horrible. And I was sort of watching it from the outside. And then 9-11 unfortunately happened. And they finally like figured out a way to get their act together because they had something that they were united and focused on. Now, 
there were some things that came out as a result of it. I mean, some 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 good public policy things that were were ha were uh, bipartisan because of the the nature of what the group had to be. <clears throat> you know, one would think that, or one would one one hope would have. The election of President Obama was a big thing in this country. It was a big thing in this world. And, you know, as a guy who's got the same color skin as he has, that is a big deal. It is huge. Uh, I had, I had, and, and it would have been just as huge as his, had Hillary Clinton won, as opposed to uh, Barack Obama becoming president of the United States. Uh, I am, I regret that he has not been as successful uh, uh, as he could have been, because I think he's, he's, Perhaps squandered a few opportunities to to maybe find some common ground, but it was kind of like you know I got to have the whole loaf, and I don't think I don't think that that's a that's a good way to run a business. And we tried we had no choice but to do. But President Reagan had for for six years with President Reagan's eight years, uh, we had a Republican Congress, and but but we still had to uh, had a Republican Senate. Excuse me. Uh, but not a Republican Congress, and we still had to reach across the aisle to be able to figure out a way to get things done. Uh, but you got to go to the table with that thought in mind, not starting from a premise that if you don't like these ten provisions of my health care bill, then uh, you're out of here. Because what we did to try to to try to, and it, I guess it's a good lesson I think in terms of how to go about doing it, we tried to establish principles. So let's just say we were going for clean air legislation. We didn't go in saying, you know, you got to have scrubbers and you got to have CO2 emissions down to here and you got to have coal done some some program between coal and and, and uh, a wind. No, we said these are the kinds of goals we're trying to reach and we had like eight or ten principles, whatever they were, and we judged every piece of the legislation as it went through the development process uh, by those factors. and. If it went outside those lines, we could say, "Hey, wait! These are principles that we want to work with." Uh, I think we would have, we would not been as successful were it not for the fact that we established it that way. And you know, I think President Obama. Let's just take health care for example. I think President Obama uh, uh, sort of took the opposite tack that President Clinton tried to take because President Clinton sort of failed in his effort to to. Uh, to get, if anybody could convince somebody to do something, it's President Clinton. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, he, he failed in terms of the way they approached it, and so kind of took the other tack. Well, let's let them start the legislation rather than me tell them, and then we'll work our way through that process. Thank you. Yep. Um, and being a good leader, you mentioned the importance of getting buy-in from your organization. Um, what are some strategies that you've used or that you've seen been used to, to help do that? Well, part of it is like, okay, let's say, let's say we've got a problem we're trying to solve, and that problem is, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Let's say the problem is these, this ice, those are refrigerators that we did here in student government, for lack of a better thing to do. So the, the question on buy-in becomes, how can you create a scenario whether, where it is in your best interest not to head to, head to uh, New Braunfels to go down the river uh, the day that you finish your last final exam and stay in College Station for another week or three days or whatever the case may be to help move refrigerators around and it's June and it's hot, okay? Those are those. You then begin to have to figure out what what it is, what factors could best convince you that it's worth your doing that as opposed to going out and drinking beer on the river, and maybe you have to do beer to get folks to stay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there are factors that I'm, I'm saying that in sort of a basic sense. But it, it's one of these things where you have to come up with ideas, solutions, if you will, that make it easier for somebody to make a decision. That's kind of like what I was saying about the member. I spent time working in an outfit called Public Strategies, and we were a public affairs and communications consulting firm, strategic communications firm. And what we did was we helped create an environment where it was easier for elected officials or appointed officials to do the right thing. 
we did the American Airlines Center, for example, in, in, uh, in uh, Dallas. And it was one of these things where it, we, it, we made it easy for the city council to make the decision to issue tax-free bonds, and then we made it easy for the taxpayers to say yes to the bonds. So you create an environment that serves sort of as, as an, an incentive or is not a barrier, perhaps is a better way to put it, uh, a barrier to making, to, to, to get into buy-in that you want. Uh, a lot of that's your communication skills. A lot of that is your style that you use and how you approach it. Uh, you know, is it my fifth trip to this lawyer who's been a pain in my butt uh, on the fifth floor asking me to do something that we're not just going to do? And finally, after the fifth trip, I've sort of beat him down, and he's like thinking that, well, yeah, this does affect somebody more than just me. Uh, so, okay, Fred, I'll let you lead me in that direction. Let me, uh, ah, there's somebody oh. else. You can ask me a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. during the time, I think quite many of you different positions. I mean, as we learn, each each style of leadership also comes with strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, is there a time period that you realized, or somebody pointed out one of your mm -hmm. the weaknesses, maybe <laughs> in your leadership style, but you turned that into? <laughs> you get that news? <laughs> as we here all face um, our own challenges and we learn how to develop our own leadership skills. Many of us struggle with plans on how we can turn those weaknesses into strengths. Let me tell you one of the greatest weaknesses I've ever had. And I don't know, well, yeah, and it's easy to turn it into, into to strength. Uh, the greatest weakness is going into a situation and not being fully informed about all the facts. Okay? And it's like fly by night as opposed to fly by instruments or fly by information. <laughs> Uh, uh, that is that is probably the most important thing, uh, and that's that's making sure you are well informed enough uh, that you can have confidence in what it is that you're about to do, or you're trying to convince others to do. That's easily correctable. That's you, I mean, you can go ask your mentor. You can go. You can go. Uh, you know, read up on it. I mean, there are all sorts of ways, but that is that is probably the greatest weakness is not being prepared uh, for what you're about to engage in. Now, sometimes you also will face a set of circumstances where these unknowns come up, uh, and and you may not have the information necessary to evaluate these unknowns. There's nothing bad about then saying, hey, I can't go there. And it's, not, and, and it's not like I won't go there ultimately, but I don't know enough. And so educate me. Be willing to let somebody else, you know, get their side of the story out, if you will. And then be willing to say, you know, I can't make that decision now. I've got to go think about that some more. I need some more information. Because if I'm doing so, you're, you're operating from a position of weakness, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it. Uh, the most important thing is, well, and another important thing is to realize that you don't know everything. You may think you do. You may have had other people to tell you that you do. Don't believe them. Uh, it, is, it is most important uh, to... Uh, to get enough of the, to realize that, that that is probably your greatest weakness. Now, there are other things. You're tired, uh, you know, you can change that by, you know, getting some rest. But I mean, there, there are, that I think is probably the biggest weakness that, that and, and, I, and I'll, I'll admit, I've been in situations where I have just been totally like strung out in terms of like not having the slightest idea. Uh, and that's not fun to talk about stuff that you don't know what you're talking about because generally you can mess up. So it's better to be well prepared. We're about out of time. Uh, let me just uh, ask uh, one final question for closing and maybe if you have other Oh, that's answers. right. The clock is wrong. No wonder y'all never get anything done over here. <laughs> uh, before, okay. Uh, can I have a closing statement after I, you? I would appreciate it. Okay, go ahead. So ask your question. How long is your closing statement? I'll, I'll decide based on your question. <laughs> Well, the foundation uh, plays an important role here that, that not a lot of students know about. Is that was my closing. So, yeah. <laughs> You're so, smart. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. 
So, no, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, what, what can we look forward to as to what directions you're charging? Let, let me tell you, we do, we do, I might, here's my, my job is to raise money and then turn around and figure out a way to spend money. <laughs> and all three of them have one, one, the, the school, the library, and me, uh, our foundation. We have like one brand, and that brand is George Bush. And so all of us exist for various purposes. I think the dean describes it best of all when he talks about the, the, the library is preserving the, the uh, historical legacy and you guys being sort of like the living legacy of, of President Bush. And we just sort of make sure the two meet uh, in terms of what we do in the programming as we talk about the importance of public service and what we do. Uh, as you may know, the library is actually run by the federal government. And with the exception of the museum and store, which the foundation owns, all of that is federal government stuff. And that which the federal government will not pay for, which is like virtually nothing, uh, <laughs> we pay for. So whether or not it's new seats in the orientation theater or the oil drilling exhibit, if we can't get somebody like Shell to step up and pay for large portions of it, uh, those things don't just happen. We pay for them. Uh, so we probably do six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year of stuff over at the at the library. And then the rest of our money, other than the programming, what well, we do our programming, then we spend a ton of our money over here. All of you guys get stipends. All of you qualify for in-state tuition as a result of it. There are tons of discretionary dollars that go to to the deans and the directors, uh, and now the department heads to to do the kinds of things that they need to do. Uh, we probably do. Exclusive of scholarships, probably another $900,000 a year or whatever to you guys so that y'all can get accomplished the things that you do. And then there's all the programming that goes around with it. Uh, we're going to show uh, in the fall, in case you haven't seen it yet, that documentary that I spent tons of money on and I'm trying to recoup costs for, uh, the movie 41 on 41 that showed on CNN. We're going to show it on campus because uh, I finally reached the conclusion that if you look at the undergraduate population, none of them was alive when George Bush became President of the United States, <laughs> unless they're exceptional students. Uh, and so, uh, or non-traditional students is a word. So we're going to be doing that. Uh, we'll have, our, we'll have our, uh, our, our annual wine dinner, uh, Vintner dinner and wine uh, auction, which is, when we, which is our major annual fundraising, outside of our direct mail, which is about 15,000 contributors a year at the neighborhood of eh, probably five or six million bucks, again, which we just kind of turn around and figure out a way to send it to you guys uh, or to, to do programming. We have Dennis Miller coming as our entertainment for the wine dinner, which is actually, which is, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we, had, we had a surprise visit by Dana Carvey last year, but we've got Dennis Miller coming this year. And so I just hope he remembers Barbara's in the audience. Uh, and uh, and then we'll and we've been celebrating the president's 25th anniversary and of all the stuff that we did back in the spring. So uh, we love doing what we do, and uh, I'm glad all of y'all are here. And I say this somewhat lightly and loosely, but it's true. Uh, you know, if you ever just want to come by and talk, come by. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. Tell you no, you don't really need to go to Washington. Uh, tell you. You know, yes, you should go to this nonprofit or whatever the case may be. Uh, but we're glad you're here, and I'm glad to be a part of it. And so is the president, who's most happy to have you all there. Thank, Thank you, you so much.